Okay, so welcome everybody for coming to 10 Steps to Financial Success. I'm Cameron Stearns, Business Development Officer with Exceed Financial Credit Union. Um, for those of you who don't know, our credit union headquarters are right down the street here in El Segundo. We have um, with the ability to do um, financial services nationwide, and we started out as a Xerox credit union. That's why we spell Exceed with an X. So most credit unions started out as a company credit union. They've kind of expanded into um, different iterations of themselves, like community charters and everything else. But um, so, does anybody know the difference between a bank and a credit union? They're members as opposed to just clients. That's yeah. right. Okay. Members as opposed to clients, and we're also not for profit. So, the people that join the credit union become members. They put money in savings and checking accounts, and then that money gets loaned back out for auto loans, home loans, low interest rate on credit cards, personal loans, and things like that. And we don't have shareholders, we have members, um, so we can give lower interest rates on loans and to be um, access the credit union to become a member. So certain credit unions are only available to people that work in certain job categories or certain companies. Other commu uh, our community charter credit unions where anybody living in that area can join. Um, we have a, a relationship with Heal the Bay, which is a nonprofit uh, bay organization that helps keep the bay clean. They do bay cleanups and things like that. So um, if somebody wanted to join our credit union, we would just give them a membership, a $25 membership in their name, and they could join our credit union without working for one of our employer groups. So. So anyway, so we have that ability. So that's who we are, what we do. We've been around for 85 years, uh, one of the longest established credit unions in the country. And we have a billion dollars in assets and about 600 different companies that partner with us to do uh, workplace um, relationship banking with us. So that's kind of who we are in a nutshell. Personally, I've been in um, real estate and finance for about uh, 25 years. I had about 10 years doing real estate, and I've been in um, banking and financial and mortgage lending for the remainder of that time. So, um, and now I get to do mortgage and business development with a credit union. So, it's a great job. I love it. I get to come out and talk to people. I get to meet all you fun people at networking events, and we get to talk to people for a living, right? That's part of what we do. Um, earlier, we're talking about who. We work with people that we get to know. That's why networking is so important. You may not know somebody in this room or may not need the credit union, but you might know somebody who does, or I might know somebody that needs your business services. And because I get to know you here today, maybe I can help promote your business in some way. So that's, that's why this is so important. Kind of the old-fashioned way of doing business, right? We're, we live in a world where social media is so important, but are they real connections? I think when you make a real face-to-face -face connection with somebody, it actually is more valuable. That's why I think getting out there and talking to people is really key. So um, maybe some of you guys have already done talks here, or maybe you will in the future talk about your business or share some information. But we have 26 different uh, presentations that we offer to different companies and different um, organizations. This is one of them and um, they chose the 10 steps to financial success today because it kind of resonates with a lot of different people, right? Um, I think a lot of the information here is in some cases very basic and you might pick up a tip or two that you didn't really think about or know about, but a lot of it might just be reminders of things that you have learned early on at some point you know, in your life. Um, so the question I always ask people is, who taught you how to manage your money? So anybody want to share? Who taught you how to be a financial success in life? My mom, <laughs> dad. Mom and mom or dad, right? Well, your dad. You you shared earlier that your father is borrowing money, so maybe wasn't. You know, I don't know. I mean, he he might have been a great example, or or, or wasn't. A lot of our parents taught us what not to do. Yes, you know. I was just gonna say. So we learned. Um, we healthy fear of credit cards and and debt and bad credit from my parents from right. mistakes. Okay. Yes. So you learned you learned by example of what not to do. Right? <laughs> So I was kind of the same way. My parents were not super financially successful. I mean, they, they worked, they were hardworking people, but they had a lot of bills and a lot of debt. So, um, so I, I made a determination at a young age, I was gonna be financially responsible and I was gonna save more money than spending. And so I kind of just evolved into that, that person somehow, I don't know. So I bought my first house when I was 23. Wow. And I don't, a lot of people were out partying. I wanted to buy a house, so that's kind of what I did. So. Where did you buy it? Um, up in the Bay Area. So it was a condo, it was small, but I kind of wanted to get in the real estate market. So, But my grandmother was in real estate, so she kind of led that 
that example for me as well. So, uh, you know, we all have different ways of learning about finances, but I think that financial education is really key. And if we can um, teach people, if any of you have children, you know, maybe you've shared some of this information with them, hopefully by example, or actually learning from financial education. So we learn from our parents, we learn from our peers. Sometimes you're not good at managing your money, you get into a relationship and your spouse kind of like gets you in order because now your uh, finances affect them, right? So, and California is a community property state, so your debt is their debt, vice versa, right? So, um, so that's important, you know. Um, so I'm working on my boyfriend right now. <laughs> and that's, that's a key thing, right? A lot of people do that. I know that my brother was not good at managing money, and he married an attorney, and she kind of got him in, in order, so kind of cleaned up his, his, his act, so. Um, so anyway, so we're going to go through the presentation today. It's a little bit about me. I know we kind of shared a little bit about you guys and um, who you all are and, and what you do, so. There are a couple of people that are in financial services here in the room, and you guys probably know a lot about this stuff as well, too. So um, that's great. So um, the, the, the topic is 10 steps to financial success, but um, financial success is really being in control of your money. That's really the number one key. Not letting your money be in control of you, but you have, having a, a plan, a sort of a thought out plan and a strategy on how you can actually be successful at it. So. Um, your money does really, I mean, think about all the people who've made a lot of money but spent a lot of money. We hear about celebrities in the news who made a hundred million dollars but now they're bankrupt, right? So, so something is kind of wrong in that equation. You could make a hundred million dollars and still be broke, right? So it's not really about how much money you make, it's how you manage your money and how good you are at kind of saving and financially planning for that. So, um, you know, maybe there's somebody in this room that made a hundred million dollars last year, I don't know. But most of us probably didn't make that level of money. But it doesn't matter how much you're making. If you're making 50 or 100 or $200,000, you could still spend more than what you're making, right? So the key is to really have a financial plan to uh, strategize on how you can make sure that you're living within your means and you're really working toward your goals there. So um, identifying needs and wants is really key. Um, does anybody know the difference between a need and a want? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need food, right? <laughs> but we don't necessarily have to go out to Truxton's every night to dinner as much as, much as we might want to, right? So, or order food from Postmates. So if we're shopping you know, at Sprouts or wherever and we're buying food and we're cooking at home, we're probably gonna save money. So our food budget is gonna be lower than if we're dining out every night, right? So, but these are habits that we get into. So you might think that you need coffee in the morning to wake up, but do you want Starbucks, right? So are you pulling through Starbucks every morning? But if you look at how much that money adds adds up, it's over time it's the little things that usually will add up to the big spending. And that's kind of where we sort of need to pay attention. So in your handout, there's actually some great stuff in here, and I, I don't have time to go through every page of it, but um, one of the little um, options is um, you've got some target dates, a short range goals, mid range and long range goals, and then we actually have some budget pages, um, net worth, ability, and kind of doing those things. We're not, we're not gonna kind of go through all those exercises here today, but I would really encourage everybody um, to go through this handout you know, after today's presentation and kind of fill them out as, a, as an exercise for yourself. I, I've been in financial services for a long time and I don't, I, haven't, I don't think I've really actually written down a budget recently, probably in the last five years. I used to do um, budget counseling with my old job. I was a um, financial counselor for, for mortgage. We would counsel people to become, help them become ready for mortgage training. So part of the step was going through their budget. And a lot of them were surprised. It's like they went through their budget and they were like, I had no idea I was spending $1,500 a month on dining out. And this was a, a person with a family, family of four and they were eating out all the time. When they really added it all up, there was $1,500 a month they were spending just on, on food and, and eating out at restaurants and things like that. So that was an easy way that they could cut and save money for their down payment for their home. So that particular program was actually no down payment. So it was a great way to buy a house with no money down. So they still exist. So. But not through my not through my company. <laughs> I was gonna say, oh. They still exist. They're called NACA, by the way, NACA, NACA.com, and they're the best mortgage out there. I don't I don't work for them anymore, but I still advocate for them. Um, my company does mortgages that we do require at least a three percent down payment. But you should check out NACA because they're they're a great they're a great company. I won't won't get into that too much today. But 
Anyway, so the handout is really is a great tool. And so part of me working for that company was really helping people work on budgets. So um, if you haven't done a budget, it's a really great exercise to do. Like I said, it doesn't matter how much money you're making, but if you, if you do a budget, it's kind of an eye-opening exercise for you, especially if you're a business owner or in financial services. I just really think it's a great tool because it helps you help the people that you're working with um, to really look at their money in a different way. So that's really key. Um, when you're doing your establishing your goals, you want to be specific and be realistic. So if you're specific about your goals, um, when will you reach it? Um, how much money will you need? Realistic, how long is it going to take? And is it a realistic goal to be able to achieve? So you really want to make sure that those are aspects of your goals when you're establishing them in step one. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Like I said, this is not like rocket science, but I think that it's if you follow these steps, a lot of them will, will actually make sense and, and can lead you, a lot of little steps can lead you to a big goal in the, in the end. And we'll look at that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, step number two is to take stock. Determining uh, where you stand allows you to establish a starting point, um, what you own, what you owe, and what your net worth is. So one of the um, exercises in the handout is determining your net worth, and that's on page two. So later you can kind of go through that and kind of figure out what you owe, and uh, what you currently own, and how much you owe. So um, you can kind of figure that out and then you can kind of come up, come up with what your current net worth is on there. So if you own property or fortunate enough to own property in, in Southern California you and bought a little while ago, your probably net worth has gone up a little bit, right? So um, if you're trying to get into the real estate market, you know, that's, uh, we live in a, an expensive part of the country, so it can be challenging to do that. But it's a good starting point to see where your net worth is and then correlation with your goals and then and where you want to be in, you know, in the short term, mid term, and the long term. Um, step number three is create a spending and savings plan. So you really want to look at your income and expenses, tracking uh, your budget busters. Um, can anybody think of like a, what a budget buster might be? You know, that's, that's a good one. I haven't really gotten that answer before. A yacht would probably be a budget buster, but that also feels a little bit optional. So <laughs> if you want a boat, you can get a dinghy or something, right? Yeah. Those are the little ones, the little budget busters. But yeah. When you need four tires, not expecting to because you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Unforeseen. Something wrong with the house. Those are usually the answers I get. It's like, okay, an unexpected expense related to something that's kind of pricey, right? Uh, your engine blows out on your car. A few years ago I was driving um, my car and, and the engine kind of blew up. It was $14,000 to get a new engine and my car was out from under warranty. So guess what? I like sold the car to the mechanic and I had to get a new one. So the car was probably worth about $14,000. So it wasn't worth putting a new engine in the car in those days. So um, that was a budget buster for me. So um, although I was able to kind of just uh, position her into a new vehicle at the time, but the car was paid off. So now I had a new car payment and everything else that goes along with it. So unexpected expenses are going to probably break your budget. Um, you could probably hold off on the yacht purchase, you know. <laughs> However, when you do buy it, can you all can you invite us? Because we yeah, so yeah. never own a boat, never own a yacht. Always be friends with someone who owns it, and yeah. just bring nice steaks every there time you, you get invited. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. And we live close Financial to. Financial tip. Yeah. So we, if you know somebody, I don't know anybody personally owns a yacht yet, but um, if anybody does in this room, let us know. We, we'd be happy to join you. So. <laughs> Uh, and what well, the funny thing is, the um, holiday chamber party was at the yacht club, right? Yeah. So was I don't know if y'all were there. I know it's probably a few guys were there. there. <laughs> right, I know. It, yeah. It's a beautiful place. The first time I've ever been to the yacht club, and I've been to the marina a lot. So, but uh, it was beautiful. Oh yeah, they're like outdoor area that with the grass, right? Right, it's beautiful. Yeah. I really like it. Very nice, beautiful boats there. So something to aspire to for sure. Um, so you definitely wanna make sure you've, you've created a spending and savings plan as part of your overall goal. Um, step number four, live within your means. So this is a, another kind of a big one that I think a lot of us um, are get kind of in the habit of kind of living beyond our means. So, so what does that mean? It seems pretty basic, right? What does it mean to live beyond your means? Live beyond them or within Be them? Beyond your means. Right. Credit cards, yeah. Credit cards, and it's pretty easy to do, right? So we see that, we see something we want, you know. It's, you go shopping for, a, if you've got to shop for a new car, and you, you kind of start out with a car that you want, but you get into the showroom, and the salesman kind of talks you, upsells you to that vehicle, right? Seats, 
seats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Heated yeah. seats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, but I want the heated seats in my next car. Those are just what? fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm in love. They are. Once you get heated seats, you can't go back to non-heated seats. Them, I want her car. <laughs> But even like base, more basic cars have heated, can have heated seats nowadays, so it's kind of a feature. Um, we think of those, those things as luxuries, but in some cases they feel like necessities, especially at this time of year, right? So once you have a certain standard, it's kind of hard to go back to those. So those are things you have, kind of have to pay attention to and watch out for, right? You have a certain standard, yet, um, you know, what if there's a change in your income? How do you kind of readjust your, your living, your standard of living? So um, that's something to think about that we might not uh, consider. Um, so living with it's very easy to live outside of our means because credit is easily available, right? Um, but the key is to if you can live within your means and think about paying for something out of the money that you have in your checking or savings account. If you can think about that first, or use credit wisely to your advantage, put it on a credit card. But if you can pay the bill off entirely, think about can I pay this bill when it comes in full? Most of us are like, well, maybe I can't do it all at once, but I can pay it off in three or four payments and I can get that item that I wanted. So where I think you really get into trouble is when you actually start to put something on a credit card and it takes you, you know, four or five years to pay off that whatever that was, that thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, and by the time you've added up all the interest, it's three or four times the cost of what the original item was. And then you're asking for credit line increases so you can buy more stuff. That's when you probably have a red flag that you're clearly not living within your means, right? If you are a small business owner, that's another challenge, right? Because now you've got a lot of expenses that pop up with the idea that down the road you're going to be making more income. So you're investing in yourself based on credit, right? So I was, uh, being in real estate, I was a small business owner, you know, working for myself. So I kind of know the challenges that come along with that as well. So my debt did go up during that time, but I was able to recoup it when I actually, my, my career kind of moved forward and I was able to, to make more sales. So I was able to kind of get caught up on that debt. So different set of challenges for people that are small business owners, you know, as well, especially if you have a newer business and you're continuing to invest in that business. So sometimes it takes a while to get a return on that investment. So those are things to, to pay attention to. So, um, so make sure you prioritize your spending, reduce, you substitute, postpone, or forego. And those are things that we're not used to doing in the world that we live in, right? We are a society where we want to um, sort of meet our, our needs right now. Instant gratification, right? Has anybody heard that term? Yes. <laughs> and the younger people that I know seem to be more <laughs> prone to that. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not you know, saying anything bad about young people. It's just that I think that younger people you know, have grown up in a world where you know, everything is instant. You know, I grew up in a world where we didn't have cell phones or internet when I was younger, all that stuff that's at our fingertips now. We had to go to the library. We actually had to go buy things and things. So. I do have to leave, but I wanted to mention, like, I think the housing part, I've seen this chart a thousand times, but mm -hmm. for LA as, in, as well as the Bay, I think it's antiquated. Like, You're right. It does not exist. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Housing is 85. I was going right. to say. Like, yeah, this doesn't fit my numbers either. I think this is, like you said, ideal or something to shoot for. Mm -hmm. And these numbers are going to bear out um, in different parts of the country. We have offices in upstate New York and Rochester. I used to do travel back there a lot. You can still buy a house for under $100,000 back there. So there are people, 20-somethings, that are buying homes that are making $15 an hour that are buying homes. You know, So the American dream works back there in a way that it doesn't work out here. Right. Now they're buried under three feet of snow, and they're wishing they lived out here at this time of year. But they all, they're homeowners, so there's a trade-off. You know, so. There's a trade-off for what for where we live, what we do. We're paying a, a price for living in Southern California. I personally love living here, and there's a high price. Where, where I'm concerned, I think most about is affordable housing for our younger people. Absolutely. You know, the ones that are trying to get a start that maybe have to move to other parts of the country or live in a, a studio and share it with two other people or something. So their quality of life is not really where they want it to be. But so there's some sort of a calculated trade-off there. You know. Yeah. So uh, step five is pay yourself first. Um, really, that's something that we don't often do. But when you're talking about really putting your money aside before you spend it, um, that's really the key. So they, the, the recommended amount is to save 10% of your income. Um, and then again, weigh your instant gratification against your ultimate long-term goal or gratification. So, so what are we weighing? You know, we talked earlier about you know, a lot of younger people um, 
there's no impulse control on that instant gratification, let's just spend it now. But I think that, I don't know if that's just a function of uh, the younger generation or just being younger in general. I don't know, I think we tend to get more financially responsible as we get older, right? There are certain things that come into play in our lives. If, if you get into a relationship or if you have children, that's theoretically gonna make you more financially responsible because you have to provide for the needs of the kids, right? You know, housing and food and clothing and all those things that are just gonna be there. So. Um, it's just, it's significantly easier to spend our money. Companies are really good at making it easier for us to spend our money. So, um, so there's a convenience factor that's great, but you have to balance that with your long-term goals. And I think if you're, in, if you're thinking um, strategically about those things, then it will help you. So um, we talked about a savings plan. They're short-term, uh, mid-term, and the long-term. Um, you know, for, you know, you're really talking about your, your liquid account, you know, for your short term, that would be your savings account or, or your checking account that you're utilizing. Um, inter, uh, immediate needs, emergency savings, we talked earlier about if you have a car expense or something like that. Um, Midterm, you know, semi-liquid two to five years, you could put that into maybe a money market or something like that. And then you have your long-term invested for five or more years, retirement and education. Um, you should always be thinking in terms of, you know, your long-term strategy of retirement. If you don't have a financial planner, you should really talk to one because that will help you strategize in the, in the long-term as well. So that, that's really key. One thing that I, we tend to recommend, or I recommend, um, is you have a banking relationship with your access to your money. But if you don't sort of trust yourself or you want to have a savings account, it makes sense to have an additional savings account where you just have money automatically moved over there. You can set up automatic transfers within your accounts usually, or even between banks these days. It's relatively easy to do. Um, you know, but that's money that goes into account that you don't really access, see, or touch. You know, it's just kind of every month a certain amount of money goes over there. I don't care if it's ten dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever that is, but if the money kind of goes over there unseen, you kind of just don't access it, right? If it's earning interest, obviously that's better because you, you want an interest-bearing account. You know, if it's a if it's a safe investment like a savings account, you're probably not going to get a lot, maybe two and a half or three percent interest. Um, credit unions tend to have better interest on savings accounts. Um, one strategy might be to have a, an account with you know, another bank or a credit union where you just kind of put a portion of that, that, that money into there on a regular basis. Look for an account that doesn't have any fees associated with it because you don't want to be hit for fees if your balance is too low. So that would be a strategy as well. And um, Exceed happens to have that, my little pitch for Exceed Financial. So we have free checking accounts, uh, great interest rates on savings accounts and all that good stuff that goes along with it. What is well, the short term, at least 10% of, of your... In each category? Or? Well, in, in, yeah, I mean, at least 10% in the short term. I, it's going to depend on what your individual financial situation is. Generally speaking, I mean, I know people who are putting 25% of their income away. I know people that have just gotten out of college and they're really interested in putting money aside. They're making over $100,000 and they don't have a lot of expenses, right? <laughs> So there are a lot of, I, mean, I do talks down in Playa Vista, there are a lot of young people that are making a lot of money these days, which is one reason our housing prices have gone up so much, right? They can't, be, uh, they can't be renting apartments over here for $2,000 a month if nobody can afford them. So they can only price things based on you know, who's buying them. Homes, a lot of homes in Westchester are selling for over a million dollars. Well, they wouldn't be pricing them at a million dollars if they weren't selling, right? So the market determines the cost. So some people, somebody can afford those apartments, some people can afford those homes. Um, that's just the reality of the market. The market sets the price. So, so in certain cases, some people can afford to put 25% of their income away. Some people can only afford 10, or some people can afford 5 or 1%. But I would say recommended is 10% overall. And you financial advisors might have a different take on that in the room, but um, I don't know. 10% based on gross or net? Gross, if you can. Okay. That's kind of a, a, a rule of thumb. You, know, you get taxes already taken out, so that's yeah, that would be your net your net okay. income. So, so it's ten percent of gross. That's ideal. Yeah, it's something to shoot for. If you could do more, better. If you if you can if your financial situation allows for less, then that's just your reality, right? Um, the other thing is, it's like we also look at and we're going to talk a little bit about bad and good debt. So, if you have a um, a mortgage payment that's pretty substantial and you're above that ideal 35%, but you're putting a lot of money towards your mortgage, but you know that that investment on that house is going up in general over the long term, then 
think about that is, okay, well, you're building equity in the house. Maybe you're not putting 10% aside for your savings account or your investments, but you're building equity somewhere. So you gotta look at your overall strategy. Where's your money going? Looking at your overall net worth and kind of getting a, a overall high view picture of where your finances are is really key. Um, if you are a business owner, then again, you're probably reinvesting or rolling some of your profits back into your business. And I don't know what the rule of thumb for that is, if it's maybe it's 20%. Any, any small small business owners? What do you what, what's the rule of thumb for reinvesting in your business? Is it 10, 20 percent? Does it whatever you can? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea. A lot of it. When I was when I was doing, we I did a lot of I went to a lot of classes, and I think they said if you can put 20 percent of your monthly gross income back into your business, you were doing well as a small business owner. That seemed like a pretty good goal to have. I, I achieved it in certain quarters and other quarters I wasn't able to. But as a small business owner, you have a lot of expenses. You have advertising, you've got you know maybe a rental space or lease space or all kinds of costs, just you know licensing, everything that goes along with running a small business, right? So with um, tax deferred and non-tax deferred um, investments, um, this is kind of a chart that shows what those would be over the long term. So if, you, if you're putting it into a uh, tax deferred, um, that's a pre-tax uh, or tax deferred investment, your money will tend to grow a little bit quicker because you're putting more money in, right? It's taken out before it's taxed. So if you work for a company and they participate like in a 401k plan, you can put money into it pre-taxed. It tends to build up um, Better. So if you're self-employed or if you work for a company, that would be different. But you also have the ability to put money into a tax deferred investment outside of your company as well. So some companies will do matching, you know, depending on what your investment is as well. And that's really great to invest up to the limit. My particular company I work for matches up to 6%. So it makes sense to, to actually contribute at least up to that amount because they match dollar for dollar up to 6%. Exactly. And I, I think the key is really talking to an investment advisor to get to really look at your individual financial picture, you know, to, to somebody who's, who can really kind of narrow that down for you, take a look at the big picture. Well, you know, and if something changes, you can always readjust, right? You know, you, nothing's set in stone. I mean, you, you can, you know, something pops up and you need to make a change. You could have to talk to your investment advisor about that, your financial advisor, and, and make that change. Thank you. You know, because no, nothing is probably going to stay the same for the next 20, 15, 10, 20, 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. But the key is really stop uh, procrastinating because that's kind of a natural, uh, you know, human state where we just like, oh, I'm going to do it later. It's not that, you know, important right now. I've got other things to do. I've got to, I want to watch Netflix tonight and I don't really want to think about my budget. I've spent, I had a hard day at work and it's just, it's too time consuming and it's not a lot of fun. So I'm going to put it off, right? Well, we're still in January, right? I think today's the last day of January. So, and January is a month where a lot of you guys had, um, you know, we, we kind of set our, our, our New Year's resolutions, our goals for the year. So financial fitness is one of those things where I think that um, it's good to think about, you know, at the beginning of the year, especially. It's also good to think about throughout the year, but this month in particular. So, um, and that's a great time. You still got time to do your budget before January's over. But to think in these terms of you're planning for the rest of the year, right? So, so now you have a deadline. You can do it before, the, before midnight tonight and you're good to go but um but that's really key so don't procrastinate set a goal you know and just actually start doing it you know and really start investing in your future that's really the key there i think so um, and harness the power of time is is really the the thing if you this is this chart really shows if you start now or if you waited 10 years um you know how that difference in in the money would be so um you guys that are in the financial um planning business, you know, you, I'm sure you know these numbers pretty clearly. So that's really the compelling argument for, for starting now and actually starting to build towards your future. But even if it's a small amount, just keep doing it because it will, um, tomorrow is going to come, next year is going to come before you know it. it's going to be 2020, 2030, yes. Um, step number six, I know we're, we, we've spent a lot of time chatting, so we'll, we'll kind of speed up to get through these slides here. Um, delete your debt. And that was a, good, a timely question because um, if your debt is really, um, if the interest on that debt is really high, then it's not doing you any favors. If you're paying 25% interest and you owe $10,000 on credit cards, but you're putting money into a savings account and only getting 3% of your savings account, that doesn't make any sense, right? right. So it makes more sense to pay off that debt first, or um, you know, you're
know, you, got to, you might get a credit card offer in the deal where you transfer that debt to an interest, no, no interest for 24 months kind of thing. And then don't make the minimum payment, but pay it off before that 24 months is over. Um, I just did that recently, so I was able to kind of transfer the money that I owed on that credit card. Now I've got two months of interest free, but I'm actually kicking in ec extra money rather than just the minimum payment because I want to pay off that debt before the, uh, the period's over. But the key is don't just ignore how much interest these credit card companies are charging you, you know, because it's costing you money. And they like that part of it because if it's an automatic system, they're going to get all that extra money from you. And guess what? They make billions of dollars doing it every day. Um, so if you can live cash only, that's great. Reduce your interest, increase the payments, aggressively pay down your most expensive debts or refinance them or move them over to an interest-free um, type of loan if you can. <clears throat> we talked earlier a bit about uh, good debt and bad debt. Um, okay debt is really increases in value. So if you're borrowing money to purchase a home, generally speaking, homes go up in value over the long term. If you're investing money in your business, if you're a business owner investing money in your business, that's a, a good debt. And then education because you're increasing your earning power over the course of your, your professional <coughs> life. Bad debt decreases in value would be spending money on clothes, meals, vacations, those types of things. Ideally, you're going to be spending cash for as opposed or you can you put it on a credit card but pay off that credit card bill when it comes so you can use credit to your advantage uh, speaking of credit does anybody have any app like credit karma or something like that I, I don't work I don't have any association with credit karma see I use it and I've been able to increase my score by 100 points in the last two years just by using the tips on their little on their app and I'm in finance, so I didn't, like, no one taught me these things about how to improve my credit score. So, but I learned it from Credit Karma. It's like little things here and there that make a big difference. I caught an old, um, like a 30-day late payment on my mortgage like five, six years ago. I caught it on there. I disputed it in the app. It was removed and my score went up. Number seven, buy a home. So we're just talking about this. If, if, you, can, if you can afford to buy a home in our, in our market area, um, if you can't afford to buy a home here and you're a first-time home buyer, you might consider buying your first home in an outlying area. You know, maybe it's kind of outside of town. Maybe buy your first place in Big Bear and you know, use Airbnb on the weekends or Airbnb it to help you pay the cost of the mortgage. That's a strategy that some younger people are doing. If they can't afford to buy a house here, they buy their first home in an outlying area. Get some additional income by airbnb it to build equity in that property and get to use it occasionally when it's empty. And that, um, maybe as a different strategy for it to get into your first home because we've got to be creative right we live in a, such an expensive part of of town you know to get into um we live we're here in westchester to buy a house over here it's going to cost you over at least six hundred thousand dollars if you're trying to buy a condo or house in certain areas it's going to be over a million right so um inglewood used to be affordable and very close by i guess have, have you heard about the new stadium they're building over there <laughs> Update on that this morning. Oh yeah, Super Bowl champions, that whole thing happening this weekend. Um, but so even so Inglewood is not affordable. The west side of LA is not affordable. So people are having to go further and further east. But so the strategy is to buy a maybe a house in an outlying area and build equity that way as well. Um, start saving now, building your credit score. We talked about how to do that with different strategies. Uh, apps like Credit Karma will give you little tips. Um, um, Different credit card companies also have, you can look at the FICO score and they're probably going to give you tips. Capital One has a little thing called CreditWise on there that if you, you can check that, it's free. These are all free apps and they usually have little simulate your score kind of things. You can play around with the numbers on there and show what your score might be. Um, but so if you can get above like 750, 760, then you're going to get the best rates on your, um, your home loan basically. So, but you. Step number eight, and I know we're running out of time here, so I'm going to move quickly. Um, diversify, weigh your risk against your return, stocks, bonds, catch, mutual funds are all good things to explore. And then market performance. Um, these are general numbers for market performance from 1926 to 2014. Um, stocks tended to perform the best. We know that that's up and down, right? It's not a straight line. So we just had a big correction in the market not too long ago. And if you look at your 401k, it might have gone down, it might have come back up. So depending on, on how that, that those are, are being managed, um, um, it's really the long-term perspective that you really want to take in that as well. Step number nine, you want to get insurance. There's different types of insurance to protect your assets, you know, health, disability, life, liability, auto, renters, homeowners. You really want to make sure, and you shop around for insurance as well to get the best price. And then plan ahead. You want to make sure you do estate planning.
wills, um, it's a good idea to put your house, uh, if you own a home, into a trust because if you don't, it's going to have to go through probate even if you have a will and then they're going to take a portion of that money out. So a trust is the best uh, way to actually own your home if you, if you do own a house. Okay, and then step number 10 is to get help. Use a professional financial institution, financial planners, estate planners. There are a lot of experts around here that um, can help. You can also do a lot of studying internet seminars like you are here today and books and magazines. So those are all ways that you can do that. So an investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. That was from Ben Franklin. So we'll kind of end with that quote. Um, any questions or comments on what we went over today? I don't think it was rocket science, right? But it's kind of a good reminder and maybe some new little things. But um, what I think will really help you guys is if you actually take some time and if you haven't done it, kind of go through this handout and fill out, figure out uh, what your budget is, maybe what your net worth. Uh, and then once you've finished all this stuff, um, you can talk to a financial planner about that. Um, you know, having a strategy, like I said, of having that account where you don't really kind of access it, even if it's a little money, you're putting $10 a month into something. Um, you know, we have accounts available if you want to open an account with Exceed Financial. You know, I'm always happy to do that for you. And it's free, and you get a free membership in Heal the Bay. We'll donate $25 to Heal the Bay in your name. So, so you get to feel good about the environment, and it doesn't cost you anything. So that's my little sales pitch. But um, anybody want to share anything about the presentation today? Um, questions, comments? or Thank you so much for coming today to learn about the 10 Steps to Financial Success. I'm Cameron Stearns with Exceed Financial Credit Union. Thank you.